79T, 2458, Learning Corp, Little Red Riding Hood, take one. A man today was grifted, or grifting young adults out of money, banned by the Alphabet Mafia, who was grifting governments out of money. Now that guys that were grifted working for an MLM, they are pissed. Conservative pundits have taken another talking point to the culture war. Stephen Crowder dons his gun bra. Ethan Klein prepares his best Jabba the Hutt impression. Prager Yu uses the example of a digital pimp kidnapping women and running offshore Mary Kay empires to show the plight of the traditional conservative. Jordan Peterson weeps only in his studio. Rolo spends four hours explaining hypergamy through this lens. And I take a big goofy coiler of a punchline into this punch bowl of content from nothing. Fill of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Welcome to Red Morning. <laughs> oh, that was a mouthful. Good morning, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed your morning. Starting this one off with a little higher energy. I'm not ready for it. You're not ready for it. But we're here, so let's do it. John Watts, sir, $4.99 super chat. In fact, where is the chats? Did I not put them up? Let's get these things going. I figure if you guys can't see this, what's the point, really? There we go. You guys are as much a part of this show as I am. So the least we can do is, hey, come on, get over there. There she is. There she is. $5 super chat. Is it true that Tate is hiding because he has the monkey pox? No, sir, we cannot talk about the cuck article. <laughs> How am I, coach? I'm fine. How are you? It's pronounced couch, but thank you very much. So many words. It's if he's been writing. That's right. So I'll get you guys quickly caught up and then we'll get into the the, the topic of the podcast here. It's an emergency podcast. We had to put this together very quickly because things are moving extremely fast and we have to make it work the way we can make it work. We do what we can. Uh, oh, I forgot to record that speech. I should do another one. I might do tag that on at the end. <laughs> All right. Um, so the topic's going to be about men and women not being the same. And I think everybody here can agree on that. But when you start getting into the details and explaining it in a practical level, a lot of people don't realize they're subconsciously doing that anyway. Um, as always, don't forget the merch store. New merch is coming out end of the month. Right on time with the second channel's Minecraft build contest. We're building the Manosphere in there. And right now, Dave's got an awesome picture of John MLD on the server. I see a bunch more stuff coming in there. It's going to be pretty slick. But at the end of the month, the new merch line is coming out. So come out and check it out yourself. Uh, if you're on the newsletter, get that on there now because you'll get a nice little uh, discount and free preview of it. But the Minecraft guys, those subscribers, they get first dibs. So it'll be pretty slick. Anyway, so men and women aren't the same. We got your narcissism versus a borderline personality disorder. We got jealousy. We got solipsism versus empathy. And of course, the old standby, since it is an emergency podcast, should men cheat? Should men cheat? So, since I don't have a Jamie in my studio, I have to set all this stuff up myself, because whatever. What's going on? I see a lot of new faces here. I'm actually pretty excited about this. New faces. That means... Oh, I've missed you too, Billy. That means we're like, we're, uh, we're making progress. Like I said, I'm not giving you guys bravado. Yeah, there's some jokes at the beginning. Uh, but it really is about male sexual strategy and positive male identity. I would have called this one rule zero, but we already used that for the main channel. So and this one, I just call it red morning. Cause it's like, I'm like, who's going to take a podcast slot overlap mine at nine in the morning on a Saturday. Nobody. It's always been my plan. What's the least likely time one of the, a grifter is going to use it? Friday night, Saturday night, they're all for it, but nobody's going to take Monday night. What's going on, Bish? It's good to see you, man. Okay. Uh, where's our war room? There's no war rooms here, sir. This is the T-Rex army. We don't have a name for the lair. We just have the lair. T-Rex is in the chat. Giraffes in the chat. If you guys don't know these references too. Actually, you know what? The small aside, before we start, everybody's like, I don't know, if you're new to the channel, you may be like, what the hell is he talking about? T-Rex army, isn't that kind of juvenile and stupid? Yes, it is. Granted. The giraffes. 
there's actually like a method to it. It's a little inside joke, and I'm going to let you guys in on it here. So you can be part of the cool kids club. Uh, everybody loves to talk about being an alpha male. You know, alpha male is this, whatever. It's just fill up a box full of good things, all the good things you like. Write alpha male on the side and throw it at somebody's feet and say, like, there, prove me wrong. And you're like, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and one of the things about alpha males is you pick alpha type animals. You're like, I'm a lion. I'm a tiger. I'm a wolf. I'm a bear. And you're like, all right. Rob says, wonderful regular to the channel, Utah, our Utah correspondent had the great idea of, hey, you know what'll, I'm trying to do a Rob impression. You know what'll fuck up a lion? A giraffe. And then you see this, he shows like, he's just throwing out videos of these giraffes just running over prides of lions and it was just hilarious so we're like ah oh, it's awesome and then mish another regular to the channel our uh, saudi arabian correspondent noticed that you know semen retention and nofap was big and so he's like yeah you know what these guys keep losing these contests every year if you are like the t-rex your arms are too short to reach and you can always win and so that's where and then the joke kind of spoiled on from there with the t-rex army we also got like a panda, we've got a giraffe, we got a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and so it's the T-Rex thing. So that's that's where they come from, and that's now you can know. So whenever you see that, you're just mocking these people in a playful way that think of themselves as the alpha male leader of men. You're like, ah, it's fine, I'm a giraffe, I'll stomp your ass. Uh, did you see that PBD alpha clip face palm? I might be actually going over that later. Because I'm trying something new this one. Because it is an emergency podcast. It's way less prepared than my usual ones. And at the end, I've got, like, I don't know, some tweets and some memes and that. We'll go to We'll get some lighthearted stuff at the end. But enough of that. On to topic. Men and women aren't the same. I'm currently finishing off the last draft before book two. And I'm noticing... Probably one of the most consistent phrases I've had to write in there. I've read it probably 40 times already. Is that men and women are not the same. Men and women aren't the same. It's easy to say that. Oh yeah, men are stronger. Women have boobs. Of course we're different. But then you realize, oh, not really. People don't really get it. And I was going to use a great example here of narcissism versus borderline. Now, if you don't know... Uh, these are terms that have been listed in the DSM. I don't know when they started, but they're currently we're on the DSM-5. That's the uh, Diagnostic Something Other Manual. It's like the shrink book of like the book of crazy. You know how you have like the monster compendium in Dungeons and Dragons? It's like that, but for disorders. And then you need these disorders because once you're diagnosed with this disorder, it's considered a medical condition. And then you can get a payout from the government. You can get pills from the supplier. And you end up on this weird psychotropic version of universal basic income which works out so well just ask anybody from the rust belt who's now addicted to ketamine lost five uncles to the meth epidemic and is part of the mexican drug cartel but that's kind of a topic for later so narcissism is and they didn't really know how to diagnose it they just saw somebody in front of them who like they intuitively knew was kind of crazy You're like oh what the hell's wrong with this guy i don't know let's uh it's completely like too much variables, things to understand here. So let's break it down to its constituent parts and describe them. Okay. I think last psychiatrist had a great piece on this. He goes, okay, so we're seeing a person in front of us. It's too much. It's too difficult to explain. So we see he has an eye, a foot, and a liver. Well, yeah, but so does a dinosaur. Okay, so he's got an eye, a foot, a liver, and he's missing the traits of dinosaur. And that makes a man. And that's essentially how things are diagnosed. They literally take a crazy person in front of them originally. And then they look at all, like, what is it about him that they don't like? And then they categorize these things. They notice, does anybody else have these that's regular and functioning? They say those are removals. And then they describe the condition. Take a, and they put it all on a bell curve. If you don't know the bell curve, it's like very few people, you know, most of the people are in the middle and then on the edge. So once you look at the bell curve, you take, like, the, I think they arbitrarily just pick the third standard deviation. Like, the top 2 to 3% of uh of people in a trait and they call that a pathological pathological level of a certain trait you know grandiosity uh self delusions of grandeur that sort of thing they draw a line there and they go everybody on this side of it has a disorder everybody on this side of it is normal seems weird isn't it but yeah that's essentially how mental health works and that's why these mental health arguments we have are so ridiculous because they're so arbitrary 
and they give a huge source of uh, of power to the kind of person who can make these diagnoses. Problem though is obviously going back to my metaphor of like what describes a man. He's got a foot, a liver, and an eye, and he doesn't have any dinosaur parts. So you're like, okay, that's a guy. Is that really a guy though? Does that describe it? Not really. And that's kind of where we are with psychology. So when you look up the DSM, there's like five or, or 12 traits. And if you have eight of them to a pathological level, they would consider it a diagnostic characteristic. Uh, grandiosity, sense of self-importance. Just think of anything you think of when you think of like an alpha male and then push it to a pathological level. And that's narcissistic disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. I do believe they might have changed a name to antisocial personality disorder, but I could be mistaken on that one. <laughs> I'm looking at Suleiman in the chat here. Wabin said I smell nice. I'm great. Good job, buddy. Now here's the there's there's two problems that come with this. One, it's 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 fairly arbitrary, right? Two, once people hear these terms are for a disorder at a pathological level, they start to equate the terms themselves with the disorder. Third problem, I mean we'll get into the third problem in a second, but yeah, so when you think of uh, grandiosity, sense of self-importance, what does that sound like? That sounds like extreme confidence, right? The difference is, you know, there's like confidence based on the things you've done, the things you've achieved, the things you have. And then there's the confidence based on just you dream up in your head how great you are. If you need an example of this, just look over to the, the president of the Manosphere. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm sure somebody in the chat will enlighten you. I'm sure somebody will. That is like an unearned unearned uh, confidence there. And that would be the kind of thing you would uh, associate with pathological. Of course, now everybody thinks any type of grandiosity is. And this is one of those little small elements when you think of like, why are men so vilified today? Why is masculinity under your attack and stuff like that? And that's essentially what's happening. Narcissistic personality disorder. And don't get me wrong, it's running rampant this day and age in the West. It is because most people were raised by helicopter parents the parenting strategies essentially have raised narcissists with any healthy sense of boundaries adults were treating them like equals you know children and adults are the same negotiating with your kids deciding i never want to be like my boomer parents that smacked me around so they treat their children like princes and princesses and then they wonder why these kids have no nothing to them but their sense of like grandiose self-importance i don't know But that's where we're at now. So you add all these things together, what happens? You end up men really suck. Now, narcissism isn't quite those qualities in the same way that your eye, your foot, and your liver isn't what makes you a man. The key part to narcissism, and this is one of those things that's been underlying throughout all the different diagnoses. It's almost, think of yourself as the director of a one-man play. That is narcissism in a nutshell. Everybody around you is a co-star, an archetype. Everything around you is a set piece. Nothing exists except for to serve your vision. And this is something that we call a narcissistic fantasy. You literally create an identity out of thin air and then demand everybody around you accommodate it. If that sounds an awful lot like a two-year-old toddler, well, that's true because toddlers only have sense of self. They're all ego. So yeah, when you think of the narcissist, think of the two-year-old because that's essentially what it is. Oh, the unhealthy narcissist. There's healthy narcissism, and we're getting to that too. You get these senses that uh, people aren't people. People are things. And this is where a lot of, uh, I would call like the, I wouldn't say it's the anger phase, but there is a lot of like resentment and anger from men towards women, and it can go backwards, but focus on God. Heaven forbid, on a masculinity podcast, we talk about men. <laughs> Who'd have thunk, right? Um, let's get that out of the way. See my pearly whites. So they don't they don't see their wife as a woman. They don't see that girl they're picking up at the club as a woman. She's a notch. She's a plate. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, women can't be plates, but there's a difference between she is a plate and her identity is a plate. Like, she's not a human being. And this is where all kinds of problems can come through. Like, for example... If you think of women as like a, an archetype and you use them like, you know, game tricks to pick her up and sleep with her and that, then you just like don't like her anymore because you weren't acting like the real you. You were pretending. 
you were you were slick you were suave you were hardcore you were awesome you were alpha male and then she fell for that so she must be stupid and it's weird because you'll see guys who have a girl sleeps with them with enthusiasm treats them like they're the greatest thing on earth and then they use that as an excuse to not like her in fact a distrust her in fact a hater because he's reflecting. He had to do all these tips and tricks to get her into bed. She must be stupid to fall for that stuff. And in that case, she doesn't know the real you and she can't really like you anyway. And this is a lot of the dysfunction that guys have where they can't, they just have to look gift horse, gift horse in the mouth. What does Rich Cooper say? Uh, complicate their life or make their lives complicated and then justify it afterwards or something like that. And I know it's easy. Like we got you in the chat here. Life is too short to care what others think. And that's an easy way to put it. But you got to remember... From an academic or an abstract level, it's very easy to understand this stuff. But when your emotions are flaring, when you're in front of real people and you're in the situation, surprisingly strong blinders that are shed on by ego. Anyways, back to back to the, the narcissism thing. So that's the that's the point. Now let's say um steal let's steal some shit from AJ Cortez. You remember his thing about women with colored hair or the devil? Uh, don't be fat, don't be this. Like you pick all these, all these, these elements, and as long as a girl meets those elements or those criteria, then she's great. But you can ignore it. You ignore everything else. I'll use a good example for this one. There was like a, a Sean Bipley. Jesus Christ, sir! Thank you, one hundred dollars super chat. Appreciate it. I just wish you had said something. So I'd love to give you a shout out on there, but the support is is much warranted and much thanked. Or I'm very thankful. That's the one. Oh, wait, where was I going with this? Lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want hot blondes. I'm not saying which country of origin you're from, but you want a hot blonde. Because in your culture, you've seen the blondes in America in the 80s and 90s, and it's like a status symbol. That's when you know you've really made it. It's the Lamborghini of titties. The Lamborghini of titties. But then that's the problem. I'm sure anybody here who's been raised in a multicultural area has seen a lot of multicultural men with blondes that aren't very good they're like hard threes hard fours you're like oh and he's bragging about it he's super excited because to him it's not about the person that's not a person in front of him that's the hot blonde it's a status symbol same thing with a lot of uh a lot of like uh caucasian people how they have like the the fetishized like japanese waifu thing They'll end up with very homely Asian girls, but to them, it's not about them being a person. It's about them being the status, the archetype, the thing they represent. And in this way, this is why it's bad for us, but it's like an extreme masculinity in a pathological way. Because we stop seeing with our eyes, we start seeing with our heart. It really does do us no favors. But then the only way around this is to not have these qualities. I wish I could say there's like a strategy to go from pathological narcissism to a healthy point of narcissism, but there isn't. It's just don't do it. And if you are doing it, try to have some self-awareness that you're doing it. And usually, once you have self-awareness about a problem, it kind of sorts itself out because you can consciously choose not to do it. If you don't believe me, think about people who are addicted to sugar going on a diet. Like if you're aware, you can do it. <laughs> not that great. Hit it when I lived in Japan. I'll bet. Oh, Real Fem Sapien in the chat. What's going on, Allie? Like the video? I can't argue with her. She's got pretty much switched on when it comes to, like, advice. Anywho. So that's men in a pathological level. Women don't work like that, though. Women have borderline. Borderline personality disorder is the female personality disorder. In the same way that you can think of the way narcissism is described now, errantly, you know, the foot, the liver, the eye thing... And how it's better described as the director in his one-man play and everything around it is an archetype. The feminine condition, the borderline personality disorder, is closer to the actress. The actress working for a director. The borderline person takes their identity from the strongest ego in the room. Or, you know, if you've ever heard of the term hypergamous best option. That's essentially this, but pathologically. And this is why you'll be on a date with a board BPD chick and everybody has their like, guys, tell me about your BPD stories. I'm sure you have them. And you'll sit there. It's like, that's crazy. She was perfect for me. We were sleeping together. She was excited. She was enthusiastic. She loved the ground I walked on. And then she flipped one day and she turned me like crap. Well, it turns out 
The Borderlines are very, very good chameleons. They want to please the director. That director is their identity. They're latched onto it. Oh, he likes the 49ers. I like the 49ers. Oh, he likes pizza. I like pizza. Didn't you hate pizza last week? No, I never did. I like it today. You ever remember War Brides? That dynamic there where it's girls once they're in a wartime scenario, their husbands are killed in the war, and then they tend to easily get over that and fall in love with the Conquerors as a survival strategy? Again, take that to a pathological level, level, and that's borderline personality disorder. In fact, why do you think borderline chicks are so damn attractive? It's the dark triad of women. The dark triad of women. The dark triad of men? Sociopathy, uh, narcissism, Machiavellianism. Same thing, but the dark triad for women? Switch borderline. It's borderline for narcissism. Yeah. Jack's here in the chat. I met two diagnosed BPDs. One was my manipulate for two years, and the nicest girl you'll meet, and the other one was boring. And it's not fake. See, that's the thing. Here, run. Uh, what is it? Run it? Run it up. Okay, run it up 647. It's not fake, and this is something I want you guys to understand. She truly believes it. There's a self-delusion that comes with the borderline personality disorder. Because it doesn't work if you lie. Uh, pin in that. Dante the Panda, 125 pesos. Thank you very much, sir. That's the saying justify or complicate their lives and justify doing it avoided online dating for months because of hang-ups finally got on and got four matches in two days what the f well in fairness dante it's because you're part of the t-rex army and because of not just me but the hundred guys that are in there now showing you tips and tricks and strategies and uh honest advice and all this stuff coming in there you took that you have your own natural talents and you just turn that into being an attractive little panda so there's no, there's no surprise for it. The WTF is for dramatic flair. Anywho, borderline. Oh, yeah, 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 borderline. Thing about borderlines that are attractive is because think of all those feminine qualities you find attractive. Now, imagine if they're amplified. That's why they're more attractive. Oh, that she's a very cute girl, cute face, but look at that one with the giant jugs. Except for in this case, the jugs of the brain. Look at the, the big feminine brain on that one. And it's not hard, because guys... When we're told what we want to believe, we wear our heart on our sleeve. She'll ask you questions. You think it's just normal conversation. It's normal banter. She's doing research, dude. What are you into? What kind of girl is your perfect girl? What kind is this? What kind is that? And you're thinking typical conversation. This is actually a pickup technique where you ask people questions and get them to tell you things. Talk more, listen, or listen more, talk less. And the other person will assume you're smarter because they get to reflect their own ideas off of you. It's the weirdest thing, but it's just how it works. Anywho, it's not a trick. It's not a game. It's not, it's it's instinctive. I'll, I'll give you a good example here. Um, from an Evo Psych perspective, I can't remember if I got this from Jeff Miller or David Buss. Either way, Rolo's talked about it, I'm sure. Men and women are adversarial. You know, in a macro level, our, our, our genetic pathways our sexual strategies are adversarial even though individually we can get along great in that right so women don't have physical strength that guys do so we have our strength and our violence and our testosterone and that allows us to influence the world around us that's why anger is mostly like a guy trait because you know i'm gonna punch you in the face if you don't do what i want and then people will do what he wants unless they can punch him back harder and then he does what they want but you see how that works I'm simplifying it. I know. Work with me. Bear with me here. I'm getting there. Women don't have that strength. So what they had to do is they had to develop manipulation. Because that's the skill they needed. Social groups, hierarchies, solipsism in a sense in a sense is what I'm talking about here. But at first there was some tools, like lying. If you lie to a guy, he'll believe you, does what you want. But that's genetically a dead end for guys. So guys that got good at detecting when a girl was lying to him, hey, I think she's lying to me do what you want anyway, or, you know, hit her with your cave cudgel. They tended to survive and thrive over the generations and the ones that didn't died off. And we started to develop this arms race of deception and detection between men and women. Right now, we're at a point where we have, women have a wonderful, evolved, deceptive capability. It's called self-deception. Because it turns out, guys, we're really good at reading people. If somebody's lying to us, we can tell something's off. If somebody's telling us a falsehood, we can look at him like, no, his eye was kind of twitchy there. He's getting nervous. He won't make eye contact. I don't trust him. And because this stuff is body language, you can't lie. You can't fake it. Uh, Joe Navarro, what every body is saying. Great book. 
met the guy back in 2008 in Florida at a convention that shall not be named. Switched on guy, used to do a lot of, like, he set up, like, all the interrogation stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan when they were doing that. He's worked with the FBI for 20 years. And he noticed that body language, you it's limbic. It doesn't go through the frontal lobe. You can't hide your body language. You can't fake your body language. Turns out it's absolutely the best way to see honesty from people. And if you ever heard that saying from the red pill that uh, ignore what she says, watch what she does, it's kind of leading to that. That, however, doesn't absolve you of the responsibility of paying attention because the girl brain has learned it's not a lie, Jerry, if you believe it. And so they start to believe their own nonsense. I'm sure if you've ever watched a girl spiraling where you were at a situation, she was at a situation, you both watched the same thing and then you watched her ramble and sputter and mumble and then totally twist what happened in her mind to be something else, you're watching self-deception in action. The beauty of self-deception is she believes things that aren't necessarily true, not necessarily factual, but they are her subjective truth or a codified uh, experience of all of her personal beliefs and for her self-interest. Now, she believes it. So when you're looking at a girl to see if she's lying, you don't see any of those traits. You don't see, oh, her eye was twitching. Oh, her leg is moving. Oh, she's getting nervous. None of that stuff is there because she 100% believes this. And this is the beauty of the feminine condition of, what does Rolo say on this one? Uh, emotion, logic, reason. You remember that pathway? Women are emotion, whatever. Ah, whatever. The point is, they use language as a way of processing emotions, and they use that to create a truth, as opposed to guys, which we tend to go from instinct to more, like, rationalize it, and then, you know, our emotions about it afterwards, right? So now we're at a situation where men and women are different. So men, narcissism grandiose self-importance you know they eventually they essentially use their own sense of irrational self-confidence to influence the world around them on a pathological level women borderline absolutely the most self-deceptive manipulative thing so when they like oh you like this i like this oh you're a fan of this i'm a fan of this that sexual thing you like that's my favorite thing to do it's not a lie they truly believe it and it's weird to explain to guys because everybody's like yo genuine desire man that's all I want from a woman is genuine desire. This isn't genuine desire. Throw that, put that shit away. Well, if you want genuine desire, what you're looking for is a BPD chick. Because that's the only genuine desire you're going to get. It's a pathological self-deception in order to get what they want from you. Now, sounds good. Whatever. She wants to please you. By pleasing you, that creates her identity. By, by self-deceiving herself, she darks the things that she likes. Everybody wins, right? If you fall in love fast... You fall out of love fast. That's the problem. Is that you start believing this is a permanent state of affairs, not realizing that that BPD switch can switch. And while you may be a hypergamous best option today, and she may be the greatest thing ever, and you might love this, and you're married, even to a lesser extent. Let's walk it back from... Actually, you know what? No, we're not going to walk it back yet. I'll put that in the next section. All of a sudden, one day... Somebody else triggers that exact same borderline response. Now, he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. She used to like the 49ers because you're a 49ers fan. Now she likes the Raiders because the other guy was the Raiders fan. She hates blowjobs because you like blowjobs. She loves anal because he liked anal. All these situations. And this is the part that's hard for guys because you basically have to understand that you're out. And you have no adjustment time. It's essentially like losing a loved one out of the blue. And you're like, Jesus. And a lot of guys, they try to hold on to that and they try to fight for that. Essentially, you go from the two madliest in love, love couple ever to the creepy stalker that's harassing this girl and is going to get beat up by her new boyfriend because he thinks he's the greatest thing ever since sliced bread and we're into everything and she likes my football team and she likes my sexual tattoos and all that stuff, right? So what is, what's the takeaway from a guy? Uh, calm down. Take it easy. Don't put your heart on your sleeve. If a girl starts probing for this kind of stuff, don't be guarded. But just be aware. Make yourself a mystery. That was the old pickup thing. Make yourself a mystery. Don't tell her everything all the time right away. Just for a bunch of reasons. One, you don't want to overcommit to a girl. And two, if it's a borderline chick, you're basically giving her the ammo to manipulate you. So why not make her job a little bit harder? But then I want to have that sweet, sweet, sweet borderline sex. I mean, you can. Go ahead. Have your fill your boots. In fact, I'm pretty much going to tell you right now, if you have not had this experience... Nothing I say here is going to change. When you're sitting there in front of that borderline girl and she's loving you and 
You think it's the greatest thing ever? You're going to ignore all this. Until the switch flips. And then it's like it never existed at all. And you're like, oh, wait. I remember now. Ryan said that thing. All right, well, he was right. And then you're going to be in the comments. Dude, I just watched this video again. And this was totally my ex and blah, blah, blah. And then I'll pin it and put it up on Twitter. And it's like, see, guys, I told you I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, get out before the trauma bond. Well, this isn't quite the same as trauma bond, but like, I, but it's it's similar. Like they're they're in the same they're on the same football team. We'll put it that way. Anywho, so walking this back from the pathological levels to just a normal level. So when you hear borderline and narcissism, think of it as healthy and unhealthy versions of unhealthy, pathological, temporary, very disruptive, a normal level. Two standard deviations. Again, you're heightened. You have, she has heightened borderline personality disorder. You have a heightened narcissism, but it's conscious. It's deliberate. It's more um, useful. Best way to put it. What does that mean for you? Well, let's see. Do I have an alarm clock going off in the background? No. Nope. I should hope not anyway. That's probably in your house. Are you sure you're not dreaming right now, sir? possible anywho uh so you meet a girl you hit it off and you want to take her on a date so you take her to the things you want to do and she goes in there and she has fun with it the neat thing here is you get to tell when a girl starts like i've never gone rock climbing before and you take her rock climbing she kind of gets into it oh it's kind of fun i like it that's an attractive thing it's not that she actually would have liked rock climbing it's that she really likes you and you really like rock climbing and so she's becoming she gets like a a plus 20 to rock climbing enjoyment, you know, let's, let's use, let's use some nerd terms, <laughs> nerfing and, uh, nerfing and boop buffing. All right. So you guys can hear the, uh, one sec. Anywho. So that's the kind of things you're looking for now. But if it looks like it's too good to be true, it just might be. Now, it's not going to change your behavior, but you can at least be self-aware so that when things change and change for the worse, you're at least keeping your head on a swivel. This is actually one of the more useful, um, probably the most useful of the mental models that you've seen in Irrational Mail and Roll to Massey, the safety net. Nobody references it but me, but I still think it's the best one. If it's not, none of these red-pilled strategies, tips and tricks and mental models are there to help you uh, solve your problems. I can do this and do this and discover the secrets of the universe and then all the chicks will fuck me and all the guys will want me and all this and all this and all this. It's like, no. All it is, is you're showing people useful models to model your world around. It's not going to prevent things from happening. It's not going to stop a girl from breaking your heart. It's not going to stop you from sleeping with three girls in one week. It's not going to stop any of that stuff. But what it will do is when the things happen, you're not going to have your ego crushed by it, your worldview crushed, what they call a zeroing out, because you understand at least well enough why things are happening. Why was that chick so into me and then all of a sudden ghosted me out of nowhere? Why was that chick telling me how much she was in love with me and then stabbed my dog? Well, now you know. <laughs> Marty, shut up. So men and women aren't different. Narcissism and borderline personality disorder. Hope you guys understand that one now. Oh yeah, it's been a while. You know what, for old time's sake, where is it? Is it this one? Ian, what do, uh, not Ryan Stone, I'm, I see he's the most important guy in the world, Ryan Stone. Give a f about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a f about Ryan Stone. <laughs> ripped <laughs> i always wonder about that how much how much money does this cost to get banned off of social media platforms you'll never know you'll never know okay so what do i got as the next one here oh jealousy oh that's gonna be a good one actually you know what let's hit to the other i usually lose you guys as the as the cast goes on that's standard for youtube so we're gonna hit the the juicy stuff first should men cheat should men cheat? You guys have seen that. Fresh and Fit talked about it. Tate talked about that. All the guys are talking about all, And the answer is obviously yes. And then you watch all the girls talking about it, And the answer for them is definitely no. And then there's a couple girls that are kind of pick-me-stife. And they're like, yeah, they totally could. But you weren't because you're great. 
Should men and women cheat? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you the answer. It's not really... And actually, it's perfect that Winemore please in the chat because I'm going to be referencing him pretty heavily on this one. Should men cheat? Should is a weird question. Should implies it's a value. Like, a good society means men cheat and women put up with it. It's a categorical imperative. Things are good because they're good. Think of, like, it's godly. It's, it's normal. It's natural. Well, natural isn't necessarily good. Arsenic's natural. Asbestos is natural. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it'll kill you. The question is, is it good? And I don't really care about that. Red Pill has always strived to be amoral. It's about strategies. What works for you? Your own personal outcomes. Right? And the thing about cheating is it's not the sex. It's about the dishonesty. For guys, it's about the sex. If your girl cheats on you, there's that limbic brain response you have, because back in the cave days, if some chick was screwing around, you never know if the kid was yours. And if the kid wasn't yours, you're raising another man's kid, you don't have one of your own, your genetic line dies right there. So the people that were good about paternity survived and thrived, and those who were not so good about paternity died off pretty damn quickly. And then whoever had the instincts to be more protective over paternity tended to have better productive odds, right? It's... That's the, the, the base, simple, evolutionary psychology reason for all this stuff. Fine. Go with that. So that's why we don't like it. We don't like it because of the act with somebody else. That's why guys tend not to be bothered when she's like, oh, I had an emotional affair. And we're like, all right, whatever. Was Did the emotion enter your vagina? And he's like, she's like, no, but we had feelings. He's like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. You mean to tell me the guy sat there and took all of your feelings and crying and you didn't sleep with him? That's awesome. Invite him over for dinner. <laughs> with guys, it's different. So girls know they have paternity. So they don't have that same instinct that guys have, which, you know, why would you need it? You always know you're the mother. At least I think so anyway. I don't know. With the way things are going now, I can't even tell you what a woman is anymore. So maybe you can't. Just one day you wake up, you're like, what the heck is this? Hello, Daryl. <laughs> um, theirs is a bit different. Theirs is about... And again, this ties into solipsism. I really should give like an entire thing on solipsism because I could probably fill a couple hours with that just on its own. Uh, it's a jealousy thing. It's a it's a social matrix thing. So you have your top tier man. With that, the acknowledgement that the female social matrix is always a struggle. It's always evolving. It's never set in stone. As soon as you get up above... The other girls, the girls attempt to prime pull you down, and you have to pretend you're not at the top while acting as if you are. So from an evolutionary perspective, they're aware of these things. What the key is, though, is the commitment. They want to make sure that this man, he may stray. You know, a dog's always going to be a dog. But when it comes to raising the kids, you get first cut of meat. In fact, you get all the cuts of meat. You want all of it. You can sleep with those girls, but they ain't getting a damn dime. And so... When you're in a situation where the guy is the hypergamous best option, and I, sh I should preface, there's two different types of cheating, red pill and blue pill cheating, so put that out there. Uh, so right now we're saying top tier guy. This is the best guy, the best she's ever going to do, the best she wants to do. She's absolutely in love. She's got all those things. She loves the 49ers, loves to rock climb. You get the idea. He goes out and gets some strange. So what's this? What's her concern? Well, what does this mean for me? First things, who did it, who was it? Was it a stranger from out of town? Was it her best friend? Was it somebody in her social circle? It turns out a girl can accept. Guy went out of town for the weekend, you know, picked up a skank there and came home, whatever. Kept his mouth shut, didn't say nothing. If he sleeps with somebody in her social circle, now she's embarrassed. And that hurts. She will probably forgive a lot, but the one thing she will never forgive is you embarrassing her in front of her social circle. She just lost a giant piece of social capital, and it's never coming back. You mean to tell me you couldn't even keep your man happy? And not only that, you had to let him sleep with your worst frenemy? The one that's been sniping at you at happy hour on Tuesdays every week for the last six weeks. Oh, you're just a bad woman. You're just a horrible wife. You're just a bad mother. And now she's embarrassed. And now she's hurt. And now she's status, status negative. You know those like, what do you bring to the tables? Well, the status boost of being married to a top tier guy is a big thing you bring to the table. And this guy just nukes that. 
That's why top tier guys even get divorced. It wasn't Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger probably got a ton of tail with, uh, what the hell is her? Shriver? What? The Kennedy chick. I don't remember her name. Anyways, Mrs. Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Katie, I think. It wasn't that he cheated. It's that he slept with the help in their house and everybody found out. That's the part she hated. Yeah, do you really want to know? One More Please has a uh, has a sub stack. It talks about 101, 201, and 301. A great trifecta of articles on this one. So it's not about the sex. It's about the dishonesty. And that's the other thing, too. So let's say, and this is where I'm going to get into the red pill versus the blue pill cheating paradigm, whatever. From a red pill perspective, it's just abundance, right? It's like, ah, eh, it was just, I was there, the right place, right the time. You know, I take care of my family. I do good things. I was lonely. It was whatever. Got it out of my system. I don't really know the chick. I don't really care. It's just basically like a, it's almost like an instinct thing. Like, hey, I saw some cookies in the fridge and I just ate the cookies. AMI is not divorced on paper. Who's AMI? I don't know, but I get what you're saying. Uh, yeah, it's just there, right time. And it's easy to accept that because you still love your woman with all your heart. It was like a thing somebody was putting during the whole uh, potato head kickboxing debacle that he went on your mom's podcast with the uh, Seguera or whatever at Megara. Who was the comedian? Talking about that he can still love his woman even though he gets some strange. And that's it's kind of one of the things he was right about. I almost kind of want to think he's listening to these podcasts right now. I got son of a bitch stealing my stuff and adding a bunch of like yelling and calling people dorks on it. Son of a bitch. Blue pill side on the other side is the unattractive qualities that men have when they're raised like defective women. That's codependence. That's uh, validation seeking. That's the nice guy behaviors that we talk about all the time in Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy. And what happens is you start getting deceptive. First off, you refer to it as cheating. Cheating as in there was a game, you promised to play by the rules and love your forever, and you broke the rules, and that's cheating. But then you hide it. You start to lie about it. Oh, no, it was nothing. We didn't do anything. You know, trickle truth. Remember how bad trickle truth was when girls are doing it to guys? Well, guys really suck at it because <laughs> we're not very good women. And so if he's lying about this, what else is he lying about? And you don't know. Well, maybe it was other girls. Maybe there's other this, maybe there's other that. And you provided a huge amount of dread. That's the other thing people don't realize. Anxiety or desire comes at the tail end of anxiety. And in this case, uh, infidelity, huge anxiety creating event. It's almost an alpha quality if you think about that. Oh my God, he's my he he might, he slept with that girl? She's hotter than me. Oh, he might try to keep, I better, you know, and in the girl's brain, it's like a fight or flight response, hysteric bonding. They go after him like, you know, like you wouldn't believe. Oh, he's going to make sure you know what you're missing here. This is why anybody here, actually here in the chat, anybody here, married, relationship, uh, you go off on a convention, you have to go on a flight, you're off for a week for whatever reason. Do you ever notice that like you have some pretty good sex the day before you have to leave? It's a mate retention strategy. It's the same thing. Like, so take that to pathological level, levels, and that's kind of the infidelity thing. Well, yeah, and there's... If you, if you sleep with a girl who's not as good as her, that's the thing, too. I guess I guess it's easier to accept an upgrade as opposed to a downgrade. It's like, dude, how bad do you think of me? <laughs> she won the popular vote. What can I say? Where was I going with this one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get this guy who's validation seeking. He has all these nice guy behaviors. He hides it. He lies about this. He uh, minimizes it. He defends. He excuses. He explains. He rationalizes. I had a friend that did this. His name was Matt. He's one of the five or six Matts that I talk about in my book, Fuck Files. Amazon today. Good bookstores everywhere. I'm going to throw in a commercial right now for it. Hopefully this is the right one. Boom. What's up? Nope. We know that. Nope. Damn it. This one? I love the way. Nope. How do I lose my own ads? Rich Cooper is Nope. Single mom. There it is. A horrible position that's not my problem. <laughs> Nailed it. Eight times the charm, fellas. Anywho. Uh, I was so busy on that one. What are they talking about? Oh, the cheating thing. Yeah, yeah. So he was married to a really hot Polish girl. Super thin. They got together when they were like 19, something like that. She was horrible, emasculating. He was codependent, validation-seeking. He eventually wasn't happy and he wanted a divorce. And then he asked her, 
And she said, no, we don't divorce in this house. We're going to marriage counseling and all that stuff. How funny is that? You want out of a marriage, but you need your wife's permission first. So he didn't know what to do. So what he did is he ended up sleeping with this chick. And she was a, another sailor, which she already tell you, okay, so she's fat. You know, like, yeah. So imagine having this hot Polish chick at home and you sleep with this land whale homely four from work. And then you tell her or you, you let her find out. So now everybody from work knows, oh, she the one that cheated on your thing at the Christmas party? And you're like, oh. For... So he embarrassed her and he needed this because he needed her to hate him to give him permission to leave. And then she tried taking him to the cleaners. She kind of went crazy, tried to sleep with a bunch of his friends. Long story short, it was a complete mess. And all because he cheated in the blue-pilled way. So anybody who says cheating is universally wrong, like you got to understand, there's like a, a wide gap between these two different things. Now, I'm not a fan of it myself. That's the other thing I should say. When I say it's amoral, I'm talking about this stuff with such zeal. It's not because I'm like looking for strange 24-7, 365. Perfectly happy with my girl. And I've told her this before. It's like, look... If I leave you, it's not going to be for another woman. It's going to be for no woman. It hasn't come up yet. For me, it's just the logistics of it. Like, oh, if I have to go running around and do this and be discreet this, and it's like, oh, it's just so much work. It's just so much work. I'd rather just leave if, if, if it's getting to that point, you know? But whatever. If she's Navy, isn't she a sea whale? No, no, no. It's a sea hag. And that was a specific girl. If you guys don't know... It was a story I spread it a whole bunch of times when I was sailing. And there's usually 20 girls to 240 guys on a, a Canadian warship. And the girls are all mid, but they all have the ego of a supermodel. And I remember there was this one. She was a, a tech, like a plumber, electrician, that kind of thing. And her nickname was the Sea Hag. She had the biggest calves I've ever seen on a girl. She was actually kind of thin, but just giant calves. I don't know. Looked like a video game character. It was that bad. At least he didn't get stabby. Yeah. So I should preface that because I don't want you guys to think that I'm just like giving you the how to cheat manual. I'm describing the dynamics here and how it plays out. And if you've ever seen this too with your parents, I don't know how many here have had parents that are cheaters. I have. How many have had friends that are cheaters? I have. How many married friends that are cheaters? I have. And here's the funny thing. This replicated so well to my own experiences in life. Like uh, stepfather, massive cheater. Stuck together with his with my mom for like 20 years until the last kid moved out. Didn't really matter. Same thing. Uh, married friends that I've seen over the years, especially times in the Navy, the ones that were top tier dudes, the ones that didn't sleep with the girls from work, the ones that didn't, they kind of kept it out. You never saw the girls. They were discreet about it. They did fine. They did fine. The ones that were very like, you know, blue pilled about it and very codependent, they were not fine. <laughs> they were the ones that got screwed over in the courts. In fact, you used to see them on the ship. You used to call them petty officer first class or watch supervisors, especially if they were French. The Quebec guys were the worst. Like, oh, my one guy, his nickname from my boss was Johnny Five. And I always thought it was like for like the robot from the show. He's like, no, no, it's because I scored five goals in one game. Also because he has five ex-wives or four ex-wives and a soon-to-be ex-wife. And they were all crazy, apparently, except for, except for this newest one. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a Quebec thing. Oh, Lord Venom. Okay, we're going to do a quick pause here because Lord Venom brings up an awesome point. Everybody copying Andrew and Tristan Tate with emergency meetings or podcast. I thought you hated Tate, yet following this direction? Classic. Still love you, Ryan. All right. Um, if you don't know where I got the idea from the emergency one for, I was talking with Rolo. We were doing a Sunday thing, and he's like, yeah. and he was making fun of like these emergency podcasts. They add a sense of fear of missing out, and it makes people more likely to click it. And I'm like, that's not true. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start naming my videos emergency podcast and then put the whatever the title was afterwards. And so I've been doing it. I did it as like a joke the first time. And then that video took off. I'm like, what the hell? I did it the second time and that video took off. And now I'm like, you know what? Fuck you guys. So now it's almost me just like saying, I don't respect you as an audience. <laughs> if you fall for this shit, it's your own stupid fault. <laughs> what can I say? I think it's hilarious. Also, as far as hating, I don't hate people online i don't know people online met once or twice it's like whatever hate's a very strong word disdain for brand i think is probably the best i best way to describe it but i mean i don't like feminist brands either i don't like alphabet mafia brands i don't like the diversity crap and i don't like ottawa people either it's just good people horrible brands but it's just because i don't like bullshit i think i've told you guys this before it's um 
you meet a true red-pilled guy, he's not going to lie to you. It's not because he likes you. To be fair, like guys like me, we'll steal your lunch and sleep with your girl, whatever. But we won't bullshit you. And it's not because we like you. It's just because we don't like bullshit. And so when I give you bullshit, assume there's a wink in there. Yeah, just had to give me some shit. I mean, if you want, fill your boots. It can't be any worse than what Rolo and the boys in the Rule Zero chat give me on their own. I saw it and clicked for years now. Well, bish, I know that. Regulars, you guys are fine. Having said that, from a from this podcast, it's doing okay, but it's not that much better. Not enough that I'd want to add. I mean, for the just the word emergency, it's probably worth about 5% more viewership. So I'm like, yeah, it's not the worst thing ever. Maybe I need to find some other catchy words. Let me know in the chat other words you add to this one to make you want to click. Like fear or oh my god or maybe some more soy face. I don't know. <laughs> Hit the like button. Yeah, I would appreciate that, by the way. It's always good. Honestly, it's hard to grow a channel if you're not uh, dancing like a clown, pissing off feminists and that. So it is a really slow growth thing. And I appreciate all the engagement you guys give because that helps. Anyways, enough of that. Let's get some levity in here. Rich Cooper's advice. Probably the best advice I've ever received from anybody. And I still use it to this day. Uh, don't work with retard. And don't work with people who work with retard. Damn, that's good. I like that. And then this happened. And at emergency twice. I can work with that. I can work with that. Get the soy face on the thing. Okay, so we already did. Men and women aren't the same. Should men cheat? And what's the time on this one? 51. Jesus, we're almost an hour in already. I hope you guys have been doing your workouts. A lot of people actually listen to this during the workout, and I've done my best to make sure my voice is an even keel, somewhat bass responsive, so it's good for you to work out with and not annoying. Uh, JD, two pounds, super chat, sir. If she's never jealous, I'd think I'm doing something wrong. Pretty much. I always have to be worried about losing you, right? But that's the thing. I miss you having people to talk to. I still do, honestly. Uh, so the plan right now is I'm finishing up the book. I've like stopped doing live streams. I pre-recorded enough videos to last to like the end of October. So I'm buying myself two and a half months to finish off the book. And right now, let's see what I just do on this morning. The whole thing's sitting in front of me. I've got about 50 sections which are probably going to be 20 or 30 chapters by the time it's done. Um, three quarters of them are done and I have to finish the rest. We're at, we crossed the 60,000 word threshold. It's probably going to max out at around 100. So that's pretty good for one week's work. But I'm not doing any fancy stuff, no effort into the videos right now, other than this podcast, because it's Saturday and I'm not working on the weekend. <laughs> Power Hour, a surprisingly racist call-in show. I like that one. <laughs> um yeah so but afterwards we got guests i'll probably have nick on rob on again wine more please if he'd have uh if i can sneak on rule zero dad again absolutely i know ali i've got her on there uh i think torsha even definitely have to have rollo it's something i realized too i always come on to rollo sunday ones never invited him to a red morning yet and so it's one of those ones that i'm probably going to get on the books because it's good we don't have to, have, like, when he's not focused on his topic, he can talk like a person and have a normal conversation. I'm looking forward to that one. I'll talk to you. <laughs> Thanks to the Ryan Ryan and Stripper. The thirsty bastards will come. I bet they will. Uh, hey, Ryan, just bought some of the hardware you recommended. Thank you for the video editing tutorial. It's pretty useful. Oh, yeah, dude, you'll love it. You'll love it. Speaking of which, Marty, I found the microphone. I'll be sending that to you so we can actually have some <laughs> last warning. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, actually... You know what? We kind of already covered jealousy in that last section here. So we're going to switch over to solipsism versus empathy. Yeah. Odovan, thank you, sir. $5. Oh, and thank God. One cent super chat. Title suggestions. 10 reasons this podcast is emergency. Number five will surprise you. I love it. It's the, it's the BuzzFeed meets Tate generation. It works well for me. Works well for me. All right. So we are going to do... Solipsism versus empathy. Solipsism. A lot of guys hear the term, they don't know what it means. And they think it means a girl is always selfish. They think, which it can be, but it's not. 
If you want to look up the clinical definition of solipsism, it's the idea that nothing exists outside of the mind of the person, right? Uh, if you ever watch those old experiments, those old behavior experiments where your monkey has a banana and then you hide the banana and then the monkey's like, oh, the banana doesn't exist anymore. Like literally gone. They, what is it? Oh yeah, they have a mirror in front of the monkey. They have the banana in front of it. He eats the banana. They put another one there. They lift the banana in front of them and put it behind the mirror. Now, if the monkey thinks the banana is behind the mirror and reaches back there for it, then he isn't solipsistic in a clinical sense. But if he just thinks it's gone and moves on to do his other thing, then yeah. Uh, can I touch on physical abuse? Uh, probably not, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's like object and permanent sort of, right? But that's the thing. Solipsism. Actually, you know what? I should almost steal Ironwood's thing about this. He does it so much better than me. All right, one second here. Oh, no, no, no. There it is. This tangled chains on the swing set of solipsism. Come on, sir. So I'm going to read out a quote here. In other words, women have a greater sense of self-importance and sensitivity to their personal actions than men. Signs of solipsism. Remember, solipsism isn't selfishness, as many Manosphereans mistakenly believe. It's more akin to self-involvement. And that can be a positive or a negative thing. A woman can be completely giving to the people in her life, sacrificing much, and still, still be utterly solipsistic. By putting nearly every issue in terms of how does this affect me, or how do my actions affect others, the female solipsistically maintains a frame that has herself as the center of the picture. She might be selfless, but she still has to be self front and center. Now you may be asking yourselves, this is back to me, doesn't that sound a lot like the idea of narcissism? It's like, yes and no. No in the sense that people still exist. They're still, they're not archetypes and it's not a one man play. You can still be the supporting cast on somebody else's narcissistic fantasy and be 100% solipsistic. All that matters is everything goes to the filter of how does this affect me? What does this make me look like? He has some great examples. and It's actually pretty long. I'll put a, a link to it here in the chat if you guys want to read it. Some of the examples he uses is like a charity. Good way of it. Actually, this is one of the better ones I've seen on it where um, you get two people up into a charity, a man and a woman. And the guy walks up to the charity organizer. Okay, what needs to be done? They usually think of it in terms of the work. Like, okay, what needs to happen in order for this organization, aka the charity, to succeed? And then I will help out as best I can, whatever I can do. If you need something, let me know. It's kind of like the lack of a sense of self and the self-awareness on it. For girls, it's like, what can I do? And it seems like a real... It, but both of them are doing charity, right? So what's it matter? Well, that's 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 the reason that men and women aren't the same. What can I do versus what needs to be done? Does that help? Yeah, Bruno using the Vortex method to invade mods. No, that's most likely uh, Billy fucking around again. It's not really George Bruno. I doubt George Bruno's listening at this point. If he is, like, you fucking idiot. Uh, he and I are on the second channel. Good, good, good. So where'd I leave off? Oh, he's a mod on the second channel. I don't want to... I guess I can make you a mod on this one, too. Yeah, I'll find you later. Uh, other examples, the workplace. A guy will half-ass it. I see another example here. A guy half-ass the report. Just puts together a presentation, delivers it with super confidence, completely forgets about it the next day. Because all it's about is making the company look good, making a good presentation. But, you know, if people like the presentation or they don't, that was his job, he was hired to do it, whatever. A girl will spend an inordinate amount of time building the perfect PowerPoint presentation, the perfect response. And if one person doesn't like her presentation, that's seen as like a personal failing on her side. So it's not so much the end product. Did we get the client? It's about the process. Do they think of me as a valuable member of the team? How does this affect me? Are people going to be less likely to respect me as a person? And a lot of times when you see these like... Ever worked with a girl who acts like a boss bitch because they say something? I've had a girl I worked with did this in the military, uh, Andrea, and she was like you have to be just like a man. You have to basically act like an asshole. And then I realized it's because because of solipsism, she didn't understand the difference between being assertive and being blunt with being an asshole. She so was just argumentative all the time. Absolutely horrible feminist. And they lumped her together with the misogynist dude who ended up being a clearance diver. 
uh, he got he got raked over the coals with him, which sucks. He was really good at his job too. Uh, this also ties into the idea of rejection. I don't know if you've ever heard. Women hate rejection. Men or men hate rejection. Women are terrified of it. That's why when you walk into a bar, oh, that's the hottest chick I've ever seen in my life. I gotta shoot my shot, dude. You walk up, you hit on her. Maybe you get shot down. Maybe you don't. But you move on with your life. You're like, dude, I wouldn't be able to respect myself if I didn't try to hit on her. And then you go hit on another girl. A girl, the idea that if I go and hit on this hottest guy in the room, the one I'm absolutely infatuated with, and he rejects me, that's going to be seen as a personal failure of my identity. I'll lose status in the social thing here. So she would rather sit there all night waiting and then go home alone than to take the chance. Even if there's like a 100% chance he'd be all for it, the chance of rejection. And again, that's solipsism. How does this affect me? Now, if he comes and hits on her, well, it's not my fault. He hit on me, right? Uh, what was I supposed to do? He's pretty cute. Why wouldn't I give him a chance? You hear this in the way girls talk about how they go on dates and that, right? It's not my fault. I didn't initiate. Think good things happen, but it's not my thing. And you always think that's says girls hate responsibility. No, it's solipsism. It's because they're hyper aware of how they're affected by the changes in persons around them. Like I said, it's, it's all about self. If a girl is forced to go walk up, it's like, dude, go walk to him, say hi. Or you know what? Better one. The most embarrassing thing a guy can do to a girl. She's like, oh, I think that guy's cute. I'm so I wish he would just walk up here. And then go walk up and tell the guy, hey, my friend really likes you. You should come say hi. Right there? Cancer. She will be terrified. She'll start crying. For that same reason. Now you've just put her neck on the line. And now has a chance of shooting shooting the shot into her reputation. And, you know, rejection. It's horrible. Terrifying. What happens then in those type of situations is the girl will actively sabotage something just so it's not her fault. And it's the weirdest thing. It's like, let me get this straight. A girl wants something. The other person seems willing to do something with her. Everything could be happy as long as she just goes along with the program. But because she's so hypersensitive about her self-perception among her peers that she is willing to ruin an absolute good thing just so she can say it's not her fault. It's like, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's an instinct. You're not supposed to understand it. Just realize nine times out of ten, it tends to work in her favor. And the one time out of ten it doesn't, she can live with that. Yeah, same thing with the girl in my org. She was a dick to everybody because this is how you thrive in a male-dominated space. Yeah, and think about that. The alternative, the alternative is she acts assertive, acts normal, pleasant, her normal self, and she's rejected by the company. You know, somebody doesn't like her, she doesn't get that promotion, whatever. That rejection, that attack on her social status in the hierarchy is so terrifying that she would rather be the bitch but, you know, they're misogynists. It's their fault. It's not hers for being a bitch. She's just, you know, I'm just doing what men have to do in this world. Completely irrelevant. It's just what happens, man. All right. Take a quick breather. Boom. What's up, fam? Got some big news to share that unfortunately is not so good. So I'm going to jump right into it. You're going to watch this video and you're going to cry. At least we can laugh at your ass as you cry like in, in the corner like a little girl in the fetal position. The thing about this, too, is it's not a bad thing. Like, it's just a thing. You can understand it. As long as you understand it, you can accept it. You can move on, right? What else do you want? Fuck, why not? Uh... So once you understand these things, you realize, like, oh, what do men bring to the table? It's like, I'm willing to take responsibility to get something done. I'm willing to take responsibility, put all of my my heart on my sleeve and take you out on this date or go on a date or tell you what you're going to do or where we're going to have dinner. And you're like, that's such a weird thing. Is that even a flex? It's like, yes, it's a flex. But didn't I just tell you that the girl's terrified of rejection? Just you going out on a limb and doing things is value. And I think a lot of guys, when they're doing this stupid argument about what do you bring to the table? I am the table. And you're like, you guys are tards. Absolute tards. Because what do guys do? They think about it the way they think about women. What do you bring to the table? Well, I'm hot, I'm six feet tall, and I have lots of money. It's not that women like those things, it's that guys like those things, so they assume women like them. I love hot chicks, so I'll just tell them I'm hot, and then she has to like me. Men and women aren't the same though, right? Yeah, of course not. Except for in that specific way that you does, it, it's different that way. Girls don't like you unless you're six feet tall. It's like, fuck off, man. How many, 
How many five foot nine guys have to sleep with women before you shut your mouth? Uh, Dark Knight Dev, twenty U.S. dollar super chat. Thank you very much, sir. Lucas and then Mig Two had a convo last night. Mig Two starts whining. Lucas disassembles the manosphere while Mig Two pulls a half ease. You have to do a red morning on Black Pill and Mig Two, and that's why the juice is worth the squeeze. Oh, dudes. I don't know, man. I don't know if I could, Dev. If you guys haven't seen this Hafiz guy, uh, Rolo showed me a thing with him and this guy, Alpha Male Strategies. He looked like he had a jacket on like he was a pool table. And he kept doing this thing where he looks up and then he just rambled. A 10-minute explanation that said nothing. And he would say one thing and then AMS would contradict him. And then he would agree with AMS because he's the bigger brand. He was just rambling, rambling. And it was just like, I can't take this. I cannot watch this whole thing. And Rolo's like, that's fine. We'll just watch clips. And like, even the clips. I'm like, dude, after 60 seconds, I just want to like stab myself in the eye with a fork. <laughs> but that's funny. Yeah, here's the thing I hate about these, like the Lucas, the MIG2 guy. I hate all of those podcasts. In fact, I hate the Manosphere. I don't, like, I don't hate, hate it. I hate it in the sense that I don't find anything valuable from it. Because everybody's sitting here talking in the abstract about men and about women and about resources and about things like i don't know anything about the law but let me rant for eight hours about divorce rape it's like did you ever think maybe looking up a couple elements of divorce law might help temper your opinion to be more grounded in reality well no because uh, uh brad pitt's divorce did this thing because the tm tmz i guess shut up shut up same thing well the if this chick here that's a giant hoe on social media says she likes big dicks, then every girl likes that. It's like, what are you taking your advice from a ratchet hoe for? She's a ratchet hoe that says ratchet things because then she gets ratchet attention. What a surprise. Do you think the girl from Cincinnati, the five at Starbucks that you were kind of into and she's sort of cute is going to act like the ratchet hoe? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Ryan's the red pill hipster. I liked it before it was cool. Yeah. And here's the thing too, Billy. Like, Billy's right. Like, my willingness to call the Madness for guys and their BS is why he has credibility. Don't get me wrong. If I see a guy making a genuine effort, putting in genuine effort, doing his job properly and being, like, somewhat professional, I'll never have a negative word to say about it. I've said the same thing. Like, uh, uh, Allie, I don't know if she's still in the chat. Real friend Sapien. What's she doing? I want to be a stay-at-home mom, dating an older man, like the trad con fantasy, right? Wear the dresses and do my nails. And I'm like, I don't, buy into that lifestyle at all it's not for me i don't think it's realistic whatever but she's doing it in earnest so i'll never have a negative word to say about her in fact the worst thing i could say is that she proves me wrong wouldn't be so bad tanner guzzy great example too mormon guy married bunch of kids runs his own business does the style thing never have a negative word to say about him because he is living it he is not larping it he's not wearing you know, Tradcon is a skin suit. He's actively trying to do it. And like I said, the worst thing I could say about him is that he proves me wrong. Whatever. Thought you were going to bust out the Pokemon theme. See, I'm a little too old. I was just, I aged out of Pokemon just as it became big. So the female Tanner Guzzi. Oh, she's been in a boxing match, has she? Yeah, how about that? Also, the other thing. You know how the Manosphere is always big on like, yeah, I'm going to box this guy and then it never happens. Like, they always threaten to fight each other and nobody fights. Only two people in the Manosphere, have ever physically boxed another person. Tanner is one of them, and the other one is Led Ed Lattimore, because he used to be an uh, amateur boxer. Used to be an amateur boxer. Well, uh, dear Billy, I don't really know. I don't watch any of the social media stuff. Occasionally on TikTok, it's kind of annoying, but I just block those guys and move on. It's not, it's not for me. It's not designed for me. Uh, what was the topic I was doing just before this? Is Tate going to fight Logan? No, he's not going to fight Logan Paul. Isn't Logan Paul doing, like, pro wrestling right now anyway? And apparently crushing it? Like, I never I never liked Logan Paul because he had that kind of Tucker Max vibe to him. But I've noticed he kind of, like, does things. Like, he works. So I'm like, all right, fair enough. He's a bit of a dick. But uh, any man who's willing to learn how to box and be in a couple pro fights, even if he's not as good as real boxers, and then do pro wrestling, and then do map videos, it's like, yeah. He's finding his way, and you gotta respect. Like when you say respect the hustle, I'm like, there's there's hustle. Granted, it's because he was like an old Disney star. He even got these opportunities, but it's not my place to judge. Having said that, I probably still wouldn't piss him if he was on fire. But that's just me. Uh, where to leave off? Oh yeah, solipsism versus empathy. So back to the topic at hand. Sorry guys, lost my train of thought with that amazing super chat from Dev. 
and this guy Mig2. Uh, empathy. You know how women say they're the empathic gender? Yeah, I have more empathy. I have more emotional intelligence than you. And I'm here to tell you that's absolute bullshit. Women are the least empathic gender. But they think they do. Remember what I told you before about uh, self-delusion? Yeah. So when you th think, like, how can they be empathic? Like, how many women have broken up their marriages, ruined their kids' lives because they're not happy? You know? I'm not happy. I want a no-fault divorce. I'm sure you guys know all this. I'm not even going to give you a preface. If you really don't know what I'm talking about, let me know in the chat and I'll give you a couple minutes. Spoiler. But, uh, yeah. But they think they're perfectly empathetic. You know why? Solipsism. Her emotions, her personal self is what matters here. How does this divorce affect me? Well, I'm not happy. And so if I leave him, I will be happy. And if I'm not happy, the kids aren't happy. If I'm not happy, there's no way he's happy. If I'm happy, everybody's happy. And if I'm not happy, nobody's happy. It's not that she assumes like lording over you like a dictator. My happiness will be the happiness of the realm. No, 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 no. She literally thinks that her emotional state is everybody's emotional state. You ever see that projectionist perception thing? That's kind of where it comes from. So from that perspective, it looks perfectly empathetic. Absolutely. Oh, this is totally empathetic. I feel what everybody else is feeling all the time. I've got great intuition. You know what that is? That's a girl projecting her emotional state onto everybody else. And of course, what do you think that's going to look like but like emotional omnipotence? Of course it looks like that. I understand what everybody's feeling, which just so happens to be exactly what I'm feeling at any given time. So they aren't empathetic. You know who is empathetic? Men. Put yourself in another man's shoes. How many men can say that? And they all do that. In fact, we do it to our detriment. Think about those times when you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I don't want to talk to that girl because my wife will think it's cheating. It'll piss her off. Or, oh, I don't want to go out with you guys drinking. My wife's going to be so pissed. Every day, unattractive men are putting themselves in the shoes of their wife, if anything, amplifying the emotions that she would probably feel towards an event and changing their behaviors based on it. That's empathy. Men put themselves in another man's shoes. Women assumes everybody's wearing her shoes. Does that make sense? It's not like being whipped. It's just picturing yourself as, a, as another person in the situation. In any, in any sense, it's actually kind of weird because narcissism runs counter to empathy as well. If you have a narcissistic disorder, there is no other person to empathize with. They're, they're not human. They're just archetypes, right? But most people aren't pathologically narcissistic. So they're back to a certain extent. And then the less narcissistic they are, the more empathy they have. Now, Ivy, obviously, you want to have, if you want to have like a good, healthy mental awareness of the world around you, you want to have, I don't even want to say a balance, but you need to have it calibrated to where you have narcissism to the point where it benefits you. You know, the dark triad traits it. But enough empathy that you don't alienate everybody around you to the point that nothing becomes sustainable. Okay, say what you will about narcissistic personality disorder. They don't have long-term relationships. They always have like a timeline attached to them. If you don't believe me, go look at some guy that I just did an advertisement on calling himself the president of the manosphere. Affable, charming, nobody's doing it to a convention more than twice in a row, right? So yeah, empathy and solipsism aren't the same thing. And a lot of guys assume solipsism is selfishness, and it's not. Solipsism is self-involvement. Everything revolves around self. It's not the same as narcissism, because narcissism is that you are the center of the world, and nothing else around you exists. Solipsism it works within a borderline environment, where you're the main female actress in the director's play and you want to do things to make them happy but everything you do is designed around how does this how does this make me look what can i do how do i avoid things and then you end up with you know avoiding rejection not making first moves sabotaging things where there's a chance you could be blamed all this stuff and it all ties in right so solipsism versus empathy now what's the takeaway for you guys well it's mostly awareness once you understand that all that empathic stuff that women are doing, it's more so just a way of them telling on themselves. And this is great. Just use that information. If she assumes you're angry, it's probably because she's angry. If she assumes you're cheating on her a lot, then chances are she's probably cheating on you. In fact, that's probably the easiest one for single guys. If a girl is hypersensitive about you cheating, 
look through her phone. I bet you anything you're going to find a couple eggplants and some peaches. Just saying. Just saying. Now, you're ideally want to be empathic so you can understand this stuff. But, hey, you're on this cast because you aren't empathic to understand this stuff. So here we are. And uh, we're going to move on now. We know that these videos really prey on vulnerable young men who have not had many experiences in dating. Calling this section Bants. Why? Because I only have like an hour of stuff that I had for you guys today, but I'm like, this is an emergency, so we got to make things work. Silver Bishop, sir. Thank you. 10 euro super chat. Feeling the same thing as the other person is sympathy. Putting yourself in the shoes of the opposite without feeling the same is empathy. I'm tired of people mixing the two terms. That's a good way of putting it. It's a good way of putting it. So where did I put this? Hold on a sec. I'm looking for something specific now. Ah, oh, there she is. I think it's this one. Mm, maybe. No, it's this one. There she is. So I saw this. I think this is what you guys were referencing earlier today. And I haven't... Can I hear it? Yeah. Oh, you can't hear it? Damn it. Hold on a sec. Damn it, I screwed that one up. Good. All right, one sec. Can you hear it now? You know who's going to help men's men make a comeback? Women. It's going to be where a lot of like, you had a, you had a, you had a girl on, on your podcast who's like, listen, this is what I'm looking for for a man. I want to be able to do this. I want a man that does this where they're looking for more alphas mm -hmm. of men who are willing to step up and take the lead rather than being, you know, pansies walking around thinking they have to please everybody. And and I think it is making a comeback. So, you know, sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, wow. That's great. No, that's absolute horse shit. Absolute horse shit. I don't know who this dude is. Some Patrick Bet David. I know Rolo talks about him. And I think that guy is Adam Sosnick. I think. I don't really watch their shit. I don't really know them. But this is what he said. They aren't looking for a man who just sits there trying to please them all the time. They're looking for a man who sits around and pleases them all the time better. <laughs> and he says this with a straight face. It's an absolutely horrible clip. And that's the thing. And he uses the term alpha. He gets it completely wrong. Alpha from like, you know, he's talking red pill because they watch two role podcasts. But all alpha means is sexually desirable. And all he's talking about is being a plow horse. This is Jordan Peterson when if he were to have a kid with the Jersey Shore cast. That's literally it. And guys are listening to this. I don't know how many guys listen to this. It's got 15 quote tweets, 341 likes. So not a huge audience. What does he have? 220, quarter of a million people thought this guy was smart enough to like follow what he's doing. Bullshit. Absolute bullshit. Yeah, it's fantasizing. Look, women say they want things. And that's great. They're allowed to want things. But... You're not obliged to offer them. In fact, it's better off if you don't offer them at first. You should wait until you get your reward first. Brifault's Law. Uh, the corollary to Brifault's Law is that whenever you make a deal, whatever uh, she promises is null and void the instant she gets what she wants. So you always go first. That's just like a flat out rule. And then he's describing here, like doing what women want being alpha. No, no. Doing what she tells you she wants is not alpha. Doing what she tells you she wants is just turning you into a plow horse. And I hate that. I hate that this is the crap that's big right now. And I have to constantly fix. Because this is just ridiculous. I wish I could give you like a more accurate or long-winded thing. But this is the bants section. I'm not taking it too seriously. Case in point. Some of my memes. If you guys aren't on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. You sprint past the wall, get a great career, and find out the good men weren't right behind you. <laughs> I like this one. It's the same thing. Girls think, you know, what would a man want? And they, they do what they want. I want somebody with a great job, a great career, stable house, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to get that for me. And then they get up there and they find out, geez, I outperformed all the guys I was interested in. Where the hell are they? And now I'm 32 and they want 24-year-olds. It's like, dude, if you want something, go for the thing you want. Don't go for what you don't want, thinking you'll get what you want. It's just one of those things. 
another one that's classic. And I'm, I, I kind of should have had this right after that. Uh, what's that guy's name? PB. Hold on a sec. Peanut butter jelly. Patrick Bet David. This is Patrick Bet David in a nutshell. So then there's the epiphany phase where you hit the wall and you want more stability. And she's like, dude, I just wanted to have a date and smash. <laughs> I don't know. Isle of Cortez, baby mama drama, a Madden dance, a hard to see. You know what, Jennifer? I know there's a story behind that, which I have no idea about. So, like, feel free to enlighten me in the chat as I go through this. I'll pay attention. And I think it's going to be funny. There's another one. PBD. If they only knew I had a good job and be a great father. Everybody's sitting there having fun, enjoying themselves. And he's like, I want to be more alpha and do what she wants. It's like explaining <laughs> Warhammer 40k to girls only worse. <laughs> But yeah, this is the thing. And there's like there's it's not new. Like when Jordan Peterson first came around, it was the same thing. There was a lot of tension in uh the married red pill and the red pill. A lot of guys that were Christian conservative, traditional conservative, they tried to like, how can I be the best plow horse for women and that'll get them in the good books and it makes me a good person and I'm very passive and whatever. And then all of a sudden everybody who was a fan of Jordan Peterson started bringing that nonsense in there and it was like a huge fight constantly to keep this place from degrading into a place that was no longer for men's sexual strategy, but how best to please the women around you in hopes that she provides you with a loving relationship, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying don't do anything. Like, if you got a girl, she's a good girl, and you guys are great together, and you have a lot of fun. She provides you with everything you could ever want and need out of a girl. Yeah, of course, at that point, doing the things that she asks and she wants just a reward for good behavior. Why wouldn't you do that? But you can't be doing that expecting that on the other end it's going to come out of wife and sex. I mean, you can. But there's a reason that these guys are grifting this stuff. It's because lonely, sad men have money and they want to hear it repeated back to them because they're begging. Please let this be true. I need you to reinforce this message time after time again. And I know I've told you guys and Rolo's told you guys and Rich has told you guys and John's told you guys about, what do they call it, the Disney fantasy? And you think, oh, that's LGBT and feminists filling our head with nonsense, telling us that we have to love women and when they shower more and all that. Oh, wait, it's shower more. Do I have that one? Is that this one? I think it's this one. I love the way girls smell. I love how you know, they always make sure, by and large, they shower. And they just have um, an, amazing, an amazing smell to them in general. Yeah, that crap. That's where the Disney fantasy comes from. It's sad state men trying to convince you to be a better plow horse because it reinforces their worldview. It's like rhinos. Rhinos form a herd. They go into a circle and that gives them strength. So he's like, if everybody else does what I'm doing and we all play by this rule book, then I'll win. Doesn't work that way, though. Guys cheat. We aren't a very good cartel. What else did I put in here? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I have this one here. It was just funny. You guys remember that's, uh, you know, you want to be an alpha me? I got a war room. This is what I see. Like, everybody's like, why do you hate Tate? I don't hate. This is what I see. This is what I see. I see a clown telling you what you want to hear and people jumping in there. It's like, oh, dude. <laughs> Can you tell what the Stedman's cooking? Yeah, yeah. Are you even an alpha male if you're not exactly like me? If you don't own a Bugatti, you're pathetic. If you haven't cam whored your girl, you're not a real man. Give me 50 bucks a month. I'll give you 25 a month to make videos for me. Rest in peace. <laughs> More of this stuff. There's virgins here. How can you tell? Ah, oh, there's 304 taped everywhere. <laughs> I got a bunch of these, man. This is nice. Thanks for not talking about the Bugatti being broken from my parents. I know that took restraint. Like all of these ones, like these ones tend to do all right. People kind of like them. Mostly because they resonate. It's what... And when you put it this way, I find it's important. Yeah, we're just fucking around. It's just memes. But a lot of guys think this way because they'll watch that PBJ guy or PBD where they watch Tate's and they tell you about, oh, if you're not a Bugatti, why are you this? And it's not that they're saying the truth and other people can't handle it. It's because socially you sound so fucking cringe. It's embarrassing. But when you explain it in like guy terms in a meme format, oh, I get why this is embarrassing now. Sitting here ranting about my Bugatti. It's not impressive. It doesn't attract people. It's not charming. It's no game. It's nothing to do with self-interested. It's basically telling people how to live in like this weird theatric way and guys taking it literally. Look, I'm here to tell you 
wrestling isn't real. Speaking of PBD, I know, you notice how all these zones kind of have a theme? He watches two Rolo live streams, and now he's sitting here talking about whammon. <laughs> uh, Dark Knight Dev, is there any articles or links that talk about Red Pill as a positive male identity and male sexual strategy? Well, since you've mentioned it, the entirety of the place is built around that. That's like asking, can you show me some articles in the Bible that have to do about, like, about God being God? And he's like, no, this is the entire thing is positive male identity and male sexual strategy. If you really want to, like, here, I'll find it. Um, let me put my, where is it? Where is... So unprofessional, dead air, typing into a keyboard, all the clickety clacks. If I'm not mistaken, it's right there in the official rules in the glossary. If I'm sick here, there it is. So if you've ever been to the subreddits where I originally kind of came from, there's a bunch of rules, and the first rule, rule zero, stay on topic. There's posts on it, sure, but essentially it's just the mission. Discuss men's identity, sexual strategy, and objects or and op options in context of our current global culture for the benefit of men. So again, look to that. Anytime you see any Manosphere content, ask yourself. They're talking about their red pilling you to women in that. Are they discussing male sexual strategy in a way that's beneficial for you? Are they discussing a positive male identity for you? Or are they trying to manipulate you into doing something for somebody else and giving them money to do it? Something to think about. There. This symbolizes exactly what I was trying to say about. Can you just talk like a normal person? And the guy's sitting there, hypergamy or 304s belong to the streets. This is what happens when you start buying into this pro wrestling crap. Don't be this guy. Talk like a normal person. You shouldn't be red pilling your girls anyway. You shouldn't be talking about your Bugatti and your alpha male. Dude, if you have to talk about how great your Bugatti is, just drive it. They can see it. And if it impresses them, in fact, if anything, being dismissive about it is probably the best thing. This one has nothing to do with anything. I just liked it. If you guys aren't, if you guys are just listening to this one, it's a picture of a, a stained glass window of Jesus and uh, St. Paul, I think. You know, my mother was a virgin when she gave birth to me. He's like, yeah, totes, that's why three random dudes showed up to your birth with gifts. Ah, fuck you. <laughs> this one here, I like it. It's again, this is just nothing to do with anything. It's hypergamy, solipsism, and self-delusion. So with some chick, she made a TikTok. You know, when he's coming back from deployment, so you pick fresh flowers, get a new outfit, make a special homemade dinner. And then the punchline is, and he breaks up with me. And she's just sitting in there with, like, her bikini. Tits hanging out. And I know, that's, that's a sad story. Doesn't sound like anything I remember from deployments, though. And then you go into the comments of it. It's like, wait, why did he leave you? I need to know more. You're stunning. And he goes, oh, he can't communicate effectively. And it all comes across as a difference and appreciative. And I couldn't deal with that. And then right below is like, you might want to pin a comment saying you broke up with him. Because TikTok makes it seem like he broke up with you when he came back. Yeah, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. A good, a good woe is me victim story. She literally dumps the guy after he's been waiting to come back after deployment. And then she puts it on as a big sympathy post. And on top of that, like, I don't know. I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let you guys come up with your own numbers for that one. <laughs> Speaking of military wives, this one, yeah. I love you and I want to stay home and take care of your kids at the top of the iceberg. On the bottom of it, 10000 in credit card debt, 50 k in student loans. Her boss is Karen and she can't cook or clean worth a damn. You would be surprised how many women want to be a stay-at-home mom. Not because they want to be a stay-at-home mom, but because they're stressed at work. <laughs> this is just me being a dick. There's nothing to this one. If you guys are just listening to this one, it's like a, a little toddler running away from a giant chimpanzee on a bicycle. And the toddler's caption is a middle-aged divorced woman and her lifestyle. And then the monkey chasing her is like cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> Basically showing that like divorced chicks are absolute alcoholics, which is true. There actually was a great thing in McLean's, which is like Canada's Time magazine, showing that binge drinking and alcoholism among women has surpassed men, and it's still climbing. It turns out women are the drunks. 
<laughs> and this one just because I like being an asshole. It's a picture of, uh, what's, is this Rhett or is this uh, the other guy from Good Mythical Morning? And he's sitting there staring at this hamburger and the, the caption on the guy is male feminist. And on the, the hamburger, it's a chick passed out on the couch. <laughs> The idea being that male feminists are sneaky fuckers, and they would definitely grape a girl if they were given the chance. I think that one's good. It's it's like the, the culmination of, I hope she sees this bro, you know? Because sometimes what a person needs is just one piece. It's a puzzle. Guy's made out of a puzzle. There's one piece missing in the back of his head. You look at the piece. She still won't fuck you, bro. Don't virtue signal to chicks. There's no point. No point. Anywho... So that's the bands. We're having fun with that. I got I got one thing. We're going to do like a little bit of like mids watch type stuff now. We're going to go through something in real time. But first, first. I'm a bigger red flag than a white guy with a podcast. I'll wait. I am not f impressed. I will have you know, I'm like 80% white. The podcast is goddamn good. And I don't want you anyway. You got random Iroquois art and not art on your walls. You're not my type, sir. Or madam. I don't know, you're allowed to say anymore? I love my work. <laughs> I love my job. Okay, uh, let's put this one up here. Is it this one? I think it's this one. Yes. This was something new. Oh, is it this one or this one? One more please might know the one. Oh yeah, this guy. Sisyphus14. I don't go on to the subreddit much anymore. I've been making an effort to kind of pop in from time to time. And I'm like always irritated by a lot of the stuff that like field reports. It's just weird. And there's this guy here who's actually trying to give you like a victory lap over his red pill model. Absolutely ridiculous. And I'm going to break down why. So we're going to end this off on a field report. I don't talk about these enough and I really should because field reports are the key to what make the red pill work for men. You mean writing it down? Yeah, writing it down. There's a reason for it. First off, swapping notes. The whole point of a red pill was guys swapping notes with each other. And how do you swap notes? Well, you write it down in notes. By writing it down, you say more than you think you're saying. Like there's like limited space. Writing takes effort. And so what you write down is what you consider important. As a subtext, it lets the guy know as you're writing your field report, what do you think is important enough to put down? More importantly, what did you not know us or think was unimportant enough that you don't write down? At the same time, other people can see their own stories through it. It gives a sense of permanence. You can look back on it. It's probably like one of the best tools. And even if you aren't showing it to other people, just writing it down, taking a week, then coming back and reading it yourself with those fresh eyes. It's amazing how much your like nonsense you notice you're pulling on yourself. And after about a year or two, once you've got your shit sorted out, you're fully red pilled, you should be able to go back at your first field reports and just cringe at how stupid that guy was. In fact, if you haven't done that, you're probably doing something wrong. So this guy's talking about concrete actions that had the biggest impact. My first instinct on this, and I've read a lot of these ones, once they say, once they throw an adjective in there, concrete actions. That's like when guys say, I calmly told my wife, and the one thing you could take for sure is that the adjective is a lie. It's always a lie. If he's calmly told his wife something, guaranteed he's nervous or scared or angry. He's talking about concrete actions. Your first instinct here is like, I have a feeling there's going to be nothing concrete in here. For reading it, it's been a year since I finally woke up. A year since the massive fight with my now ex where something in me snapped. A year since my first OY OYS report. A lot of emotions boiling deep down. I've grown immensely this year, but there's still so much work to do on myself before I can call myself a proper man. Here's the six concrete actions I took this year. What does that actually tell you? Like when you read that, there's nothing in there. He fought with his girlfriend. He got really emotional, but he still has block work to do before he can be a proper man. What the fuck's a proper man? What makes a man proper as opposed to improper? You know, but that's the thing. It's full of container words. Proper man. Write it on the side of a box, fill it up with a bunch of emotions, throw it at my feet. I'm supposed to sit here and understand it because what I think of as a proper man has totally different shit in it. And it's those little manipulative container words that you realize a guy is literally working off of feelings and not working off of anything concrete. So his first step, and this is going to rub a couple people the wrong way, seeing a good hypnotherapist. Again, changing how you think. 
Not changing anything you've done. There's no concrete action to this other than he met the guy. I don't care what macho men say. What the fuck's a macho man? Like other than Randy Savage. This is too important. Without one of the four hypnotherapy sessions, four sessions in a year, and he's running a victory lap too. Think about that. How much commitment does it take for a quarterly visit? Sit there and let somebody else talk to you. Everything else would have been more difficult and slow. It's the same as therapy, but instead of talking about your problems, your past and limiting beliefs, you actually confront them. Therapist makes you visualize situations, purely fictional or from your past, and act inside them. So literally LARPing. Here, imagine, imagine if you were in this situation, what would you do? And you picture it, it's like, I would do this, I'm fucking, I'm the man. It's literally, remember those guys, when they were in like a social situation, they had some really clever shit to say and they forgot about it, but then that night they're talking, they're like, oh man, if I'd have said this, that'd have been hilarious. Damn it. That's the thing. So during the first session, I realized just how much I hated and despised myself and how much this had been me being miserable for years. I saw myself as a child. I saw how I pushed that child away. And this is the cause of deep sadness I was experiencing. It's all feelings. I feel lonely. I feel sad. I feel like a child. I had the power to change them. I was constantly hiding my true self from others, despised myself for the cowardice. Like all this shit is about how he feels. Do you see what I mean, though? Concrete actions. Here's a concrete action I took. I saw a hypnotherapist, and I feel and I feel really bad about myself. Then I stopped feeling bad for myself, and I had to trick my brain into doing it by seeing a therapist. He told me a bunch of hypothetical situations. I thought about what I would do, and that's great. Like, this isn't a field report. This is fucking LARPing, dude. But notice, like, the language. It's always theatrical. And that's the other red flag if you see a guy talking about his thing. When he starts writing like he's trying to impress the audience... You can just tell he's still validation seeking like he wants whether he's convincing himself or he's convincing us. He wants me to think that this was Lawrence of Arabia, the home game. You know, I've been hiding my true self after my first session over the course of a year. I reconciled myself little by little. I clawed my way back into life. Like, what does that even mean? What does it mean to claw your way back in your life? What happened in your life before he got into a fight with his girlfriend and broke up? The fuck is there to claw back from? You know, cry for a day, eat some cereal in your bathrobe, go back to the gym, and you're fine. But instead, you have to make it sound like a battle between Megatron and, you know, Optimus Prime. The part that makes me laugh, too, is when, uh, and I did this before, where he's talking about, like, actually addressing your problems, not just, uh, not just thinking about them. And it's like the entirety of a field report is to handle that. And his field report is to mention how he actually did stuff but without using a field report, come in here. Like the whole point of coming here is to say, what did I do? What am I trying to achieve out of it? And how did I do? And then other guys are like, oh, okay, you missed this. You forgot this. Try this. This is great. Whatever. And he'll be like, yeah, you're right. You're wrong. And I'm going to do these actions. It's called an OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. The purpose of a field report is the observation and orientation. So you see what you've done over the past year. You, you write it down. And that's you observing it. In this case, his six options. Then you orient towards a new set of decisions like, okay, so now that I know this information and how it had outcomes on my attempted, you know, push, whatever I want to achieve, what about it is right? What about it is wrong? What do I need to get? What do I need to keep? What do I need to remove? And then you make a decision. Okay, that means I'm going to do this moving forward. And then you act. And then you write down another field report. That's how the process is supposed to go. This guy is bypassing all of that. He's been quiet for a year. Hasn't done shit. Then wrote down his frame again. If you have to write, there's no way you can write down your worldview. You have to experience it. That's what he means by frame. It's how you approach, how you perceive things that are going on around you. You know, 10% uh, what happens, 90% how you treat it. So I don't remember how I came up with this, but I thought to myself, I have no idea what frame was. So I wrote it out. It came out as a list of actions I valued and actions I despised. I do not accept being talked down to. I do not accept when people try to bring me down. I enjoy spending my time with people who spread positivity, and I like people who are curious, etc. These are all validation-seeking goals, by the way. These are horrible goals. And most of the work that I do in Patreon with guys and their field reports is just getting this shit out of their system. And you know the beauty of it is? I love this. So it's like, you know, a couple bucks a month. You guys come in, we do these reports. This guy's 12 months in. There's a couple people here that are probably in the Patreon. They will tell you right now. Nobody should have to take 12 months and still not know how to make a proper goal. I could have saved this guy 
11 and a half months of time. He would have written this down as his first field report. I'd have sorted this right out. Here's the thing. Why is this a shitty goal? It's because there's nothing he can do to change it. Oh, dude, the best adult dating site is here. That's awesome. Here, let's uh hide you briefly. I can't, I won't be talked down to. Well, you can't change what other people do. If somebody wants to talk down to you, they're going to. I do not accept it. I mean, granted, that's a bit better, but nobody accepts being talked down to. Nobody wants it. But even the way he's phrased it, like this could be easily framed and as I'm not going to waste my time on people talking down to me. That's something you can change. How you spend your time is a change that you can make. It's binary. Did you spend time with people talking down to you? Yes or no? You know, I don't accept when people try to bring me down. Again, people are going to try. Maybe they feel insecure about it. Maybe whatever. Accepting it's not a nephew. Same thing. I enjoy spending time with people who spread positivity. And I can only just make a reference to why more please on this one with... Uh, you don't spread positivity. Happiness is a choice. You decide to see the best in things. If you need somebody to like only be positive all the time, like, I don't know, it's just he expects other people to do stuff. I like people who are genuinely curious. What, what the fuck does that have to do with frame? My frame is chicks with big tits is awesome. It's a short list, but it made me realize that the girl I was with was on the wrong side of most of my values. They're not values. They're wi There's a wish list. Again, Hiding from that fact, didn't hide from it any longer, suddenly had something to fight for. Fight, you mean fight against? Stood up to her for the first time as if writing my values gave them legitimacy. Again, assertive bill of rights. This is the other thing. Like, talk to the guys right at the beginning. When I say no, I feel guilty. Manuel Smith, assertive bill of rights. Your values, your frame, all that stuff is legitimate because it's yours. That's it. You don't need authority from anywhere to give you permission. You're allowed to be irrational. You're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed not to know. You're allowed not to care. And that allowance comes from you, not from some list that you write down, not from some authority, not from some guys with flair. It's from you. And of course, that intern is steely framed over Arnold overnight. Yeah, it's like Arnold's the frame example. But I finally understood why fighting for one's values. Why are you fighting with a girl? Again, Anything that's outside your frame is amusing, intriguing, or funny. I could have saved this guy 11 months. Come in. The first time he starts talking about frame as a as a, as a a list of things he wants from people, I just sorted that right out. Dude, if somebody's doing the shit you don't like, it's no longer a part of your world. You kick them out. If you don't kick them out, you put up with it. But either way, you've made your decision. <laughs> Reading when I say no, I feel guilty was extremely important. I love this one too, by the way. So if, like the sidebar essentially has that. As the number two thing to read. First is Robert Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy for the validation seeking stuff. The second is Manuel Smith and his uh, assertiveness stuff. Third one is Rational Mail. So that lets you know how important these two books are. The fact that he's running a victory lap over doing the bare basics. This is like the equivalent of saying, yeah, I actually just started Strong List 5x5. Five five. It's the best gain I could have ever done. It's like, dude, you paid the cover at the bar. Stop bragging about the bar. And the she ban. So this one here, like, this is probably the one helpful thing he's done is put on here. The she ban. And this is just a simple thing. The reason why I say field reports are so useful. Another telling thing you can tell by what somebody writes is the, the perspective that it's from. So when he's writing things that, you know, she does this, she does that, she, 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 she. You're writing your own uh field report from a girl's perspective from somebody's perspective who's not your own how can you have frame when you can't even describe your life from the first person you know i don't like how it's a rule because then guys will just adhere to the rules as opposed to like understanding why it's there which i think i don't know if we got rid of it or not but the idea is you're not supposed to do it as a rule it's a strategy uh lycanthrope noir thank you sir five dollar super chat no sir i will not talk about the cuck article uh, gotta learn that marketing works because it works. Give into the dark side, search your feelings, you know it to be true. Hey, that's why we're having this emergency podcast, sir. Thank you very much. And then gaining more control over my mind through meditation. So he breathes deeply. He thinks about it. He thinks, he thinks, and he feels, and he feels better. Basically, if you're angry and then you give yourself some time to calm down, that's not fucking meditation. I meditated every day. So I sat still in a room and just breathed. My mind was racing. I try to imagine the future. 
basically all he's doing is like having a panic attack and then waiting for it to pass on. This is why I hate this shit. Everybody talks about meditation. Look, if you want to do it because it's fun, that's fine. You want to know a really good meditation? I used to have panic attacks. That's one of my very, very, very earliest things way back in the day. I found after a heavy set of squats, couldn't panic. My central nervous system was fried. It was just too shot. I was just too calm. Couldn't do anything. So instead of sitting there every day and panicking, you notice though, like here's the thing. I feel, uh, I stopped talking about my girl. I read a book. I wrote stuff down and I saw a guy to talk to me. Nowhere in here, he talks about the six things of biggest impact. Where's the fucking workouts, dude? That's right there, the bare minimum. If you can't be arsed, to at least like do a healthy workout, which is the only thing that all men can agree on. If you can't even be forced to do that, why would anybody give a shit about any of the rest of this? You're basically LARPing. So he's gaining more control over his mind. I don't know what the fuck that is. He booked a one month trip alone. This actually in fairness, I like this. I do suggest at some point, every guy give it a shot. Cause I did it myself. It's just one of those things. Like if you have approach anxiety, one of the ways that I got her out of it is I just flew to Mexico one week. Just went for a week, didn't tell anybody, went there by myself, didn't know anybody. And there's no, like, whatever, no consequences. Somebody can like me, somebody can hate me. I'll never see them again, ever in my life. And so when you have that freedom to just try whatever and not care, you find out that all of that stupid anxiety about approaching, it's all in your head. So yeah, he kind of got there. So if anything, this one's kind of nice. Not so much red pill as it is pickup, but whatever. To be fair, out of all the six things he had, he mentioned one. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about this. So here's that. What about lifting? Well, it's actually the one thing I fucked up on. Like, th the basic bare bones. Like, I didn't have enough money for cover. I went from lifting to way to channel my anger because I had to, and then I wanted to look good. But that's stupid. I stopped lifting because it had become a chore. You see what I mean? It didn't make me feel good anymore, and so I stopped doing it. The only... Like, almost the only action in this entire thing. And he stopped doing it because of how he felt. And then he started to hate himself as he saw the muscle he had built slowly transform around the waist. In other words, he got fat. He got lazy. This is... Uh, I think a lot of guys talk about it as in putting your foot on the gas. It's not entirely that. Here's what happens. When you're angry, you're motivated. You feel good. You go to the gym. When you're angry, your workouts kick ass. When you're angry, you stand up to that bitch ex-wife or ex-girlfriend of yours because fuck that bitch. You can't tell me what to do. Feels great. You'll read Glover because, yeah, this book's going to fix everything. I got this. I'm a fucking man. I'm the fucking man. And then, you know, your girl's gone. The, the stressor is gone. Uh, maybe she starts having sex with you again. You know, things get better. And then you stop being angry. What happens when you're no longer angry? Well, you haven't built any discipline. You haven't done any actions. You've been so focused on your feelings that you just stop doing things. Eh, I don't need to work out anymore. I don't feel angry. Eh, I don't need to gain my wife. I don't feel anything. And here's what happens. Now, in this case, he broke up with his girlfriend. But if this was a wife at home, she probably started having sex. You know, he was angry. He acted more attractive. And then he's like, you know what? She's been pretty good right now. I don't need to be this, this major asshole. And he starts acting like his normal codependent self again. And he thinks this is the funny part. He thinks it's a reward. Here, I'm no longer going to be that red pill dick. I'm going to go back to being the husband you know and love. And then the problem is, that was the exact, exact guy that she decided to stop fucking. He gets fatter. He gets codependent. And then he gets angry again. Damn it. Everything was going so well. Why'd you have to ruin it? He gets angry. He starts working out, doing all this stuff again. He kind of, it's a cycle of emotion. I feel good. I do work. I get success. Then, from the success, I reward the success by being the exact person that didn't get that before. Then I get extra mad and do it again. Now, it's not just a cycle you can repeat either, because every time you bottom out on that cycle, you erode a little bit of that trust. So every time she starts seeing a guy acting attractive, like every time the wife or the girlfriend, oh, you're acting attractive, you're doing this. Now it's like, oh, is this like last time? Is this only going to last six months? Oh, that's great. And then you erode that trust and you erode the ability for people to want to see you succeed. And so every time you run through this cycle, it makes your life objectively worse. And this is where you get these goofy guys. They'll make like um, subreddits like punching Morpheus, X red pill, any of that crap. What they end up doing is they're like, the red pill was horrible and it ruined my life. And this is why they say that because they didn't do anything. Anyways, I like this one. Other people gave harsh criticism. So here's mine. 
You're obsessed with your internal experience that you are delaying or sabotaging your external reality. I just told my six-year-old this when he was angry with his brother, and I'm going to tell you. You don't wait for your mood to improve before you do something. You do things, and then that makes your mood improve. Think less, do more. I mean, I could go into it. There is basically every word you see on this is shitting on the guy for being a fucking idiot. So I want you to be aware. Like when I talk about field reports and red pill, like I'm talking about stuff like this. In the future, if you decide, you come in the Patreon, you start writing field reports, there is a system that works really well. Not because you have to do it this way, but because as a strategy it works. This is why I don't like to give it as like a, a shopping list of things. I don't want you to adhere to rules. I want you to pick the parts of it that make sense. First thing, OODA. Observe, orient, decide, act. You understand the process. You observe something. You orient your decisions based on what you think you want out of it. You make a decision and then you act on it. And then you observe how that action's consequences work and you repeat the loop as fast as possible. And that's how you make progress. Second, past tense. When you talk about, I need to do this, I want to do this, I should do this, I'm planning on doing this, eventually I'm going to do this. All you're doing is giving your wish fulfillment. It's a New Year's resolution. You feel really good because I said I was going to be a better man tomorrow. That's great. And then you sit at home and do nothing. You're focused on your feelings. You can't bullshit yourself about the past. I did this, I did this, and I did this. These were my actions. And now you're observing your actions with fresh eyes. What can I do about this? Other guys observing it as well. Everybody learns from it, right? Third thing. So we've already talked about uh, the OODA and we've talked about past tense. Third thing is a clear defined set of goals. Your goals need to be binary. You may have heard the term SMART goals. Use those if you want to. Just know that when you have an expected outcome, it needs to be binary. I need to have be able to say objectively without qualification whether I did something or I didn't do something. Don't worry if it's the right goal. Don't worry if it's the perfect goal. Don't worry if it's the proper goal. Just worry that it is a goal. You can always change your goals later on. Again, you can change your mind. It's a sort of bill of right thing. Change your mind for no reason at all. My goal is to sleep with my wife. Turns into my goal is to be more attractive. My goal is to divorce my wife. My goal is to let her back into my life as a plate. Like whatever. Your goals can change as fast as you want, but each one is binary. I can say whether you did it or whether you didn't. And that allows you to anchor the actions you've taken and the observations you're taking, and it creates a better situation. Example, I my goal in this scenario is, you know, my wife, dead bedroom for a year. My goal is to be more attractive and to have sex as soon as possible. Let's say, let's say three months. Let's just pick a number out of the air. It doesn't even matter. I'm going to have sex within the next three months. I've been in a dead bedroom for a year. So the guy starts talking. And what does he do? Well, I tried to impress my wife this. I bought her flowers this. I did this. I did this. And guys can look at it and go, your goal was to get laid, right? So why are you acting supplicative towards your wife? She already doesn't want to sleep with you. What about that girl that was at work? She was flirting with you. Did you escalate with that? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, why didn't you? I thought your goal was to get laid. Well, it was. So then this girl here was like giving you a whiff and you didn't capitalize on it. Why not? Well, I don't want to sleep with more women. I want to sleep with my wife. And then you realize again, the goal is bullshit. And that's number four. Your goal can't rely on other people doing it for you. So a lot of guys make this mistake when they're first doing their marriages is um, I want my wife to find me attractive again. I want my wife to start sleeping with me more. I want my wife to fuck me. And you can't do that as a goal because it will succeed or fail based on what the wife does. Now, if you remember before, during the section we had on solipsism here, when you put that kind of responsibility onto her, she will sabotage it on purpose because she doesn't want to be held responsible for it as solipsism. How does this make me look? You know? So your goal isn't to, to fuck your wife, it's to be more fuckable. And then to be open to whoever does it. Now, more often than not, most wives are perfectly happy to have sex with like a top-tier husband. And you become a top-tier husband, they generally get on the thing. Not always the case. A lot of guys have found, well, gotta go get my needs met. Demote the wife, divorce the wife, whatever you want to do. But the goals are binary. And so that's the takeaway for this I want you guys to grab from it. Anyways, uh, did I... the hell was this one why did i put this in here do we have time what's the time on the thing one sec i might do another one but i think not oh yeah we're 154 we're gonna end it here we're not even gonna look at this one where'd it go sorry dun -dun. 
Got one more for old time's sake, and then we'll do some bants and enjoy the, the rest of the time together. One of the guys who ran the Red Pill channel sent me a message. I actually appreciate that you took it from an idea-based perspective instead of ever resorting to personal attack. Like, if this movement is actually going to be dangerous, do we need to understand it so that we can take it down? I knew going into it that this might be a hot mess. I'm not going to have those guys back on my channel again. Absolutely not. That crazy broad was all right. <laughs> okay, we got five minutes, then we're going to end the cast. I don't know if I'm going to do Rule Zero today. I'm probably going to get some work done on the book. Two out of ten. Jesus. Harsh critic, man. Harsh critic. So at this point, it's just whatever you guys want to ping off me in the chat, and then we'll work with that. Uh, stop that one. Austrian girls are good enough for me still. Thanks. Hey, if you like it, you like it, right? If you're successful in sleeping with other women, you're a high-value male and fuckable. Yeah. I always hate the term high value mail. I can't stand these marketing terms. I know what it is too. It's like marketers hear this red pill stuff and they A, B test things. And then whatever ones resonate with the audience and does better on, you know, whatever list you do, they use it again. That's how, that's how really bullshit terms always end up on the top. Oh, okay. Yeah, here's a good one. Actually, since the topic of rule zero is guys talking about their worst mistakes, what would you say is yours? Um, I don't know if there is a worst mistake. That's the thing. Like, I think about mistakes. And, like, what is a mistake, really? It's something that you did that didn't have the desired outcome. And then I know it's the pablum thing to go, well, the, each mistake was a learning experience for me, which is kind of true. If I had to say a biggest mistake, then, I guess it would be when I first went to university for graphic design to get a job as a graphic designer, expecting that to be a great career. It was right at the turn of when graphic design started to become like an online internet thing. And so it was a generally bad choice. But I mean, I couldn't picture myself making any other choice. I wanted to be an artist and I was good with computers. And it was the only thing that mixed the both of them together. It had the worst outcome out of all the choices I've made. But I mean, at the same time, it's come in really handy for this. It was really good because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have joined the military. And I just don't know if I can use it as like mistake is kind of the worst way to describe it. Like, I never knocked anybody up I shouldn't have. I never got married to somebody I shouldn't have. Didn't get a chance to pick my family. That stuff was out of my control. Leaving the military, I left when it no longer worked for me. I joined the military and had fun with it when it did work for me. I joined corporate when I enjoyed it. When I stopped enjoying it, I left. I'm one of those guys that, like, if you get into a situation where I'm looking like this is a potential mistake and something I could regret, then I tend to just make, like, a, a make a decision. Actually, that's the fun thing, and it's something I don't know how to bottle this up and sell it to you guys. If so, I'd be a fucking millionaire, but I know usually what I would do if something was really bothering me in my life. Like, you know, the graphic design really wasn't working well, financially wasn't doing so hot. So I just got drunk with a buddy one day, and then we were talking about, like, my dad used to be a paratrooper, and his dad used to be in the military. And so we called up, we're like, whatever, let's join. It sounds like a fun adventure. Next morning, sobered up, went into the military. That was it. And then one day I was sitting there and I looked through the career stuff after the whole administrative violence thing. And I looked and I'm like, okay, so if I stay in now, I have to have another three years to beat out my PER slump right now, because even though I've done nothing wrong, I don't have a year of stuff to report for. And so it tanks my career for three years. And then I look over a 20 year career. Where does that put you ultimately at the end of your career? Assuming everything else goes perfectly. And I'm like, that's pretty subpar. At best, I would end up as a watch super or like a, a head of department, a P1. Not bad, but not great. It's not a lieutenant. It's not a lieutenant commander. It's not a chief. So I'm like, and then I look at the numbers on that. I'm like, okay, so they make this much. The pension would be worth this much. Technically, if I had stayed in, 2023 would have been like my full full retirement. So how funny is that? Next year, I get to have that navel gazy moment where I think like, would I be better off now? And I looked at the numbers, by the way, I earn more doing this than I would at the pension. So I'm like, fine, I'm fine. Anyways, I did the math and I realized, okay, so what do I have to do to have a better outcome than that? I'm like, well, as long as I earn 20% more than I'm earning right now over a five-year period, I'll basically come out ahead of where I would have if I stayed in the military. And then, you know, go to corporate. It's like own 25% more and then 30% more. And that's the whole six-figure thing. And I did that for five years. So I met my goal. No mistakes there. And then I'm like, I don't like this at all. And that's when I decided to do this. I'm like, yeah. See, there's not really any, there's not really any mistakes and I'm surprised people make mistakes they live with and I've met them. Like I get it. I did the 
20 year high school reunion and I saw people who made mistakes like, oh, I've, I haven't done anything in my life in 20 years. I didn't get to travel the world like you, Brian. And I'm like, oh, I don't know why you're bitter about like nothing stopped you from leaving. I left. <laughs> it wasn't hard. My little shitty small town. Yeah. But I don't know. It's like I set myself a goal. I made an attempt at it. And then when I got the outcome out of it, I decided, was that a good use of, oh, was that good or was that bad? And if it was bad, I made a change. And if it was good, I stuck with it. That's essentially it. So I don't, I don't, I, I guess the whole framework of just calling it like, what mistakes have you made in your life? Oh, uh, actually, here's a good one I can think of. I threw away my Super Nintendo back in 2010. So I took a micro ITX board and I soldered it and all the cabling into a Super Nintendo. The controllers worked. It had an Xbox Media Center. It was essentially like a media center with a working Super Nintendo on it. All the arcade games and that. I really do regret getting rid of it. I should have kept it. I think I gave it to my neighbor had like a, a nine-year-old kid and they were just she was just divorced. And the kid used to always sneak over to my place when my sister would come down to visit because they were like the same age. And they would just sit there playing Nintendo all day together. And I remember when I went to move to Montreal, I'm like, ah, you can have the thing. She's like, wow, thanks. Should have kept it. <laughs> Fuck around. Anyways, that's all I got. Uh, Jordan, sir, thank you for the $10 super chat. The Black Heart. Is that Black Heart like the, the medieval reference? Or Black Heart as in like Black Pill guy is starting to fall in love? <laughs> all right. Anyways, that's all I got for you guys. Thank you for sticking around for this one. Uh, whoever's channel it was, I forgot. I might be there. I might not be there on that. Did I miss anything? Stop calling it a mullet. Dark Knight Dev, sir. $5 super chat. Passport bros. They say game isn't needed in other countries. I think game is more of a necessity. Thoughts? Of course it is. Dude, there used to be like old pickup things on how to pick up girls in countries where you didn't speak the language. Like little things too. Like uh, if you want to buy a girl a drink, just point at your drink and then point at her with like the raised eyebrows. Don't just hold up cash because then they think... You're hiring her as a prostitute, which may or may not be effective. Uh, it's where your body language matters, your tone, your cadence, you know, the sense of touch, all that stuff. But yeah, you absolutely need game and you need that stuff in other countries. And everybody thinks, now granted, American women are just different. Anywhere around the world, I will say this. I can usually kind of get like a feel, like there's always subtle differences, but American women are like 100% different. So game is needed because women are just women. Uh, Dave Laro, $10 super chat, $10 for your emergency fund, no BS content appreciated. Hey dude, like I said, if you guys keep watching, I'll keep pumping it out. I appreciate that. Uh, I already did the outro. Yeah, let's just end it. I'm just mumbling at this point. Do I have like a count intro thing? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here, well, I got something. Is it this one? Yeah. I don't know how to describe it, man. They're just different. I wish I could give you a better answer than that. They're just different. I don't like it, but I think that's because of my Canadian sensibilities. And keep in mind, too, my time was only ever in, like, uh, the West Coast and East Coast, up and down the coasts. So the Heartlands probably, and the Flyover States probably have a completely different vibe to them. But give it a shot. I mean, worst case scenario, you find out Croatian women aren't your cup of tea. Although most of the people in Croatia ended up being from Montreal anyway. Later, boys. <laughs>